So natural selection is the only agent of change that produces an adaptive change. And there are a lot of ways that it can come about. A lot of times natural selection arises to avoid predation. This is a good example here. In the American Southwest, there are ancient lava flows that produce black volcanic rock, which contrasts markedly with the light colored sand around it. And a lot of animals, including pocket mice, have evolved uh, different colors, different coat colors, depending on where they live. Populations living on the dark rocks favor a darker color. Populations living on sand favor a lighter color in order to blend in with their surroundings and thus avoid predation. In the same environment, the same ecosystem, all sorts of other animals have also adapted this uh, two-toned variation within their population, including lizards, insects, and other rodents. This is another example from your text, the common sulfur butterfly. Uh, caterpillars are usually a pale green, which is excellent camouflage uh, when they're eating their preferred food, which is alfalfa. Right? They match that color, so they blend right in. There is another color morph, a bright yellow color, which is kept at low frequencies always because of predation. That yellow color stands out against the green alpha alpha. It's easier for bird predators to see these caterpillars and they're eaten before they can mature and reproduce. Climactic conditions also can affect natural selection. Many studies are conducted on genes that encode enzymes because the consequences of different frequencies of enzymes are directly assessed, right? so they're easy to study. In these genes that code for different enzymes, there's often allele frequencies that vary with environment. A good example from your text is the mummy chog, which is a small fish that eats mosquitoes. There's two different alleles that form two different enzymes that vary based on latitude, right, on north or south. And these are enzymes that have to do with respiration. Northern enzyme functions better at northern temperatures, allowing fish to swim faster and survive better in these colder temperatures than fish that have the southern allele, which functions better at warmer temperatures. Another driving force behind natural selection is pesticides and microbials, antimicrobials. There's a widespread use of these chemicals that can lead to widespread resistance. At this point, over 500 species of plants, insects, bacteria, and fungi have some type of resistance against pesticides. Usually, animals and other organisms are resistant to one mode of action, one type, a pesticide, but multiple resistance is also possible, such as in the housefly. Houseflies have pesticide resistant alleles at a couple different locations. The pen gene decreases insecticide uptake into the cell, so that's what you see at the top there. Um, it just doesn't even enter the cell, so it doesn't have a negative effect on the organisms. The KDR and DLDR genes decrease the target sites for the insecticides completely, thus decreasing the binding ability of the pesticide. Another good example is the Norway rat, which is commonly controlled using warfarin, a blood thinner which is used therapeutically in humans. But as a pesticide, it can be used to decrease the clotting in rats and thus increasing the likelihood of hemorrhaging. Norway rats now have one gene that kills, completely kills, the efficacy of uh, warfarin. Another um, good example here that your book doesn't mention, but it's, it's just such a great example, we'll talk about it briefly, is drug-resistant bacteria. Uh, you may remember way back from the beginning of the semester how we were talking about horizontal gene transfer, conjugation, transduction, transformation within bacteria. Bacteria in general have low mutation rates, but they have huge populations. So we're going to see a lot of exchanging of um, DNA, particularly beneficial DNA. 
A good example is Staphylococcus aureus or staph infections, which were originally treated with penicillin in the 1940s. By around four years later, in the late 1940s, penicillin was already ineffective. Staph had already developed a resistance against it. Then people started treating it with methicillin. In 1968, we have the um, advent of MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. In 2002, staph became resistant to the next line of defense, vancomycin. Right? So now we have Versa or vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. At this point, Versa is still rare, but it's really only a matter of time before it becomes more prevalent. In the US alone, around 2 million people a year are sickened due to drug resistant bacteria and around 23,000 people die. So it's definitely a significant problem. How do we quantify natural selection? Right. We can use a concept called fitness, which equals the number of surviving offspring that are left within the next generation. Individuals with one phenotype are going to leave more surviving offspring in the next generation than individuals with an alternate phenotype. Right? If a phenotype is selected for, there'll be more offspring bearing that phenotype. This is a relative concept in that the most fit phenotype is the one that produces more offspring on average than the other phenotypes. Right? Selection favors the phenotypes with the greatest fitness. So the phenotype with greater fitness is going to see an increase in frequency as offspring possess the same traits and pass them down to their offspring. There are three main components to fitness. Those are number one, survival. But even if survival is equal, number two, we have sexual selection. Some individuals are just more successful at attracting mates. For example, in territorial animals, large males will attract and mate with many more females than males that have small territories or no territories. The classic example of sexual selection is the male with the large tail, right, which will attract and mate with more females than males with less colorful, smaller tails. Finally, number three, the number of offspring per mating. Um, this is a good example of this would be large female frogs, fish, spiders, which lay more eggs than smaller, uh, smaller individuals. So to calculate fitness, we have to take into account all three factors, survival, mating success, or sexual selection, in the number of offspring that are produced per mating. And we can't predict fitness from just one component. So a good example here is the female water strider, right? Uh, larger female water striders do lay more eggs per day. And that's this graph on the left here. So the bigger the insect gets, the more eggs are laid. However, larger female water striders survive for a shorter period of day. So period of time, rather. That is the middle graph here. You can see survival steadily. Oops, pointer to start, uh, survival steadily decreasing um, per size right, as the insect gets bigger. So that means because we have these two extremes canceling each other out that the intermediate or medium sized water striders have the highest fitness. They're capable of producing um, the most eggs, um, surviving to mate, and lay those eggs. Natural selection has a few different roles in maintaining variation, some negative, some positive. It can remove variation from populations by favoring one allele over another. However, it does work to maintain population variation in a few different circumstances. Frequency dependent selection is where the fitness of a phenotype depends on its frequency within the population. 
how common or how rare it is. Negative frequency dependent selection is when rare phenotypes are favored by selection and become more common. So fitness has a negative relationship with frequency. So a couple different scenarios for this. Rare forms may not be in a search image of predators. Animals, including people, form a search image and become adept at picking out certain objects among a group of objects. And if a particular prey organism is rare, it may not have formed a search image in the predator's mind. So it may be preyed on less frequently. This is the case of the water boatman, an insect that is preyed upon by fish. Fish will eat the most common color type um, than they, more often than they would just by pure chance alone. Right. Um, it also could be down to resource competition. Genotypes sometimes differ in their resource requirements and rarer genotypes will then have less competition for the resources they need. This is particularly true of plants. Positive frequency dependent selection is the opposite. This is going to favor the common form and eliminate variation. The rarer a genotype becomes, the more selection pressure is against it. In other words, oddballs stand out. They are, uh, attract attention from predators and end up being eaten more frequently than the more common genotype that blends in. So with frequency dependent selection, the strength of selection changes over time as frequency changes. With negative frequency dependent selection, rare genotypes become more and more common. And as they become more common, that selective advantage will decrease accordingly. So they may become rare again. With positive frequency dependent selection, the rarer a genotype gets, the greater chance it will be selected against. So a change in frequency leads to a change in fitness. Oscillating selection is selection that favors one phenotype at one type one time and another phenotype at another time. The favored phenotype changes as the environment changes and the effect will be to maintain variation if that change keeps repeating. So a seasonal change, which is what we see in the ground finches of the Galapagos Islands. During drought, birds with big bills are favored because small soft seeds run out, but there's lots of larger, harder shelled seeds. Birds with smaller bills, however, are favored during wet conditions because there's tons of small soft seeds to go around. Finally, heterozygote advantage, where heterozygotes are favored over homozygous. This works to maintain both alleles in the population, so it works to maintain variation. A good example in humans is sickle cell anemia, which is a hereditary disease that affects hemoglobin, the protein that carries oxygen in red blood cells. It results in irregularly shaped red blood cells that then results in severe anemia. Homozygotes for sickle cell anemia uh, usually die without reproducing if they don't have medical treatment. In other words, there's a 100% selection pressure against this sickle cell allele. But then why is it still around? The frequency is fairly high, uh, much higher particularly in Central Africa where the leading cause of death is malaria, which you might remember is a parasitic disease transmitted by, as a protist transmitted by mosquitoes. Heterozygotes for sickle cell allele do not suffer anemia, and they're also much less susceptible to malaria because the plasmodium causes red blood cells to sickle, and these are removed by the spleen before uh, the parasite can reproduce. So because heterozygotes have an advantage in survival, 
that sickle cell allele remains.